Hello and welcome to part number 15, the composing part. And that starts, of course, with the rendering and the practical footage. And what is the big difference between a practical footage and the rendering? The rendering, I have to create the motion blur. With practical footage, I have it pretty much for free. And that has, of course, a reason that I do this, because if I don't do so, I have very sharp footage from ZG and very motion blurry footage from time to time based on a camera movement, of course, from the practical camera. And so I have set up in the physical rendering here, of course, some motion blur. Not too much, just a little bit. And on the camera, I have, of course, 40 millimeter inside of the focal length. The sensor that I have used when you use 6K from left to the right on the sensor, it's 30 millimeter 0.7. And when you go lower in the red, 5K, 4K, whatever, you have to reduce this value here, of course. So it leaves me only to say I have here the shutter angle on 180 degree that fits exactly the camera, but Sometimes I have increased this value extremely. Why do I so things? Just to get a video look? No. I have done it for the butterflies. So I get these creamy motion blurs. So they fly really into a kind of painterly cloud. This is more an artistic idea. As the opposite would be when I want to have a safe private Rhine aesthetic, when I go here maybe to 30 degrees or even smaller. Anyway, I have a tiny little bit of lens distortion in it based on my crit that I have used. And I have a vignetting in it because the lens has roughly this. You have to make tests with a credit card and a lens distortion crit to get your values for your lens. There's nothing that I can give you here and say use this all the time or so. Okay, this is pretty much all. One little note. This builds up on the multiple series and the integration 101 series that I have done for Cineversity. And I don't want to explain too much again, but what I want to do here is of course go through the footage that I have done. It's always a sequence of images. That is what I suggest normally to do, not to work with QuickTime files, because when something happens then you have to re-render everything. Image sequences are even helpful when we use them for camera projection, just to take out one image and use it as it is. What I like to have on them is, of course, 32-bit floating point. I can't think about anything better or maybe 64 bits. <laughs> okay, it's not that big. It's very well compressed and it has all the data and it is linear from the start. No gamma, no nothing in it. And it contains a far more advanced color space than, for example, when you use anything PNG with sRGB or so, which is certainly claustrophobic in days where we talk about REC 2020. Okay, UHD is on the horizon and we will have to work with that and we will take advantage of it. Okay, so we have here, of course, our comps. I have them numbered and that is pretty much no secret. Anything else not so important. What I want to do here is, of course, to show you how I have the flow inside. And in the part 16, I go then into everything, color and curves and so. This time it's more how it is put together and what is my logic normally when I compose things, even if it is that small like this one here, small in terms of time. Okay, so I have taken here out some files client wish and that is pretty much the core of the whole series here. Take everything apart, keep it separate so you can just put things back in again and you have the lantern then in or not. And that is a huge advantage if someone said, no, we don't want to have that. We want to have something else. So the more separation, the more power you have over any changes here. That gives me the first point here. And then the second point, the object buffers, very important, very powerful. And to combine them is, of course, not so much an advantage. It saves a little bit space on the hard drive, but hard drives are not that expensive anymore. So I like to separate them. And now I can go and say, I want to have this dragon or I want to have this dragon in my color correction. And I can do this. 
just like that. So I combine them here and then I create what I need for the composting, a glow mask, of course. The glow mask is pretty simple here. And when I go here to my effects control, I will see instantly I have a fast blur on it. That's maybe not the highest quality, but it's sufficient for this kind of work. And this is normally pretty simply explained. I go here into invert, but first I blur it. That means I get around this border here, a gradient. And this gradient is what I'm after. So this would be here without invert and then I invert it. And then I go with the darken mode to exactly this, what I had before. And with darken, I have then only something that starts where the object is very wide. And then it goes very fast and quickly into the dark area. This gives me then the option to take advantage of it. And when I take a look, Dragon 3, Clomas 3 comp, then I will find where that is. And the Dragon Glow Mask is this one here. I can't switch it on, you see it. And it's used here on this layer. And I can solo this here for a moment. And this is all I have here from it because it has now the background image blurred and then only mask in it. So just to make the point, you can see here the dragons with all the light that reflects here a little bit. And when I switch this off here, you see now they don't sit very well in the whole scene. This is all too bright here at the moment. All this stuff will be changed with the color correction. But without this, it just gives these hard edges and it doesn't really work inside. And when you think about motion blur on top of that, after all, then this gives a very nice combination of all these elements. Very important. So let's go back to 25 because that eats you a lot of power. <laughs> and just go back here. So it's relatively small, but maybe on a 4K monitor you will see that in a very detailed way and when your eye gets stuck here then you want to have of course the best result. Similar to that we have something to do here but this is then more for the color correction and that is then in this picture here where I have decided already I want to have just this picture here and I go with a glow here over it. That means fast blur and then I put this just in screen mode over it. Screen in the newer version, of course, it will not work in 32-bit in older versions. And that is then, of course, way too bright. And that goes already a little bit into color correction. And so I have to dial it back. And that is pretty much all I have to do. The color correction then in part number 16. From there I go to the titles. And that means title and credit. And... That's a little bit too big. Let's go here to 50 or something like that. And you can see here my little logos and of course the title. What I haven't mentioned so far all the time is of course Chinatown 48. That means Chinatown is the title of that score and 48 is the kilohertz just as a reminder. This was done in Logic Pro and I have just put it together. It's a little thing. So we had something at least that gives a little bit mood. And then finally here we have the UHD version just very large and uh, I go here just in the compositing setting. And this is in frame rate 24. This is my output for this file only without titles. So I have a file that is in ProRes 444 or four times four if you like so. And this is then fed back here into my area and so I can use it in the way I want to have it. Okay, that's pretty much all. See you in part number 16. Thanks for listening.